Anyway, hello and good morning to uh, uh, you all. My name is Gary McCauley, and I have been a member. You really want me to use that? Yes. You really want me to use we that? We do. Yeah. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> I, will, I will use this. Anyway, uh, I've been a member of the Historical Society for uh, about 15 years. Um, I'm happy to see all of you. Uh, today I'm going to give a little overview on a topic that some of you, uh, uh, that on some level is near and dear to all of us. And yes, I'm going to be doing a certain amount of reading because I just am not as smooth as Henry. Um, but um, anyway, that is about how the real estate in industry in Manhattan Beach has influenced and continues to influence our town. The truth is, it's a really, really big subject, and I'm not an expert. Um, in fact, I'm almost ashamed to be up here talking about real estate. Uh, how many real estate agents actually do we have in here today? Everybody raise their hands. How, how many people? Holy cats. Okay, well, <laughs> you probably know more about this than I do, and, uh, and honestly, um, I just want to put some things out into a broad context. Uh, so I'm going to breeze over some of the major points of our history and maybe refresh everybody's history. Uh, the truth is a lot of these things could be expanded on, upon as individual topics, quite honestly. Um, and so those of you who do have expertise, I invite you to, if you're any kind of writer at all or can find a ghost writer, um, it'd be really nice to get those stories written down um, and, and, you know, to get your expertise and your history on paper for the future. Um, anyway, I will undoubtedly make errors at, as well, and I uh, just don't throw things at me. <laughs> Feel free to just boo. <laughs> anyway, uh, so it's important to keep in mind, and let's see, it looks like I'm supposed to already be on that screen. Anyway, that uh, pretty much uh, Manhattan Beach began, thanks to uh, the real estate industry began as a uh, land investment, um, I don't want to say scheme, uh, scheme's the wrong word, but uh, it, was, uh, it was brought about by people investing in property. Going back uh, a couple hundred years or so, the area that became uh, Manhattan Beach was just uninhabited sand dunes. And I think it's, it's really hard to wrap your head around how this, there was nothing here Nothing here at all. Um, in fact, we were part of a sand dune system, a lovely sand dune system, that uh, basically ran from Palos Verdes north to uh, Bayona Creek. That's a lot of wasteland there, I want to tell you. <laughs> and yes, uh, the Gabriel Amio, Tampa, Keech Indians, uh, originally roamed the area hunting and collecting shellfish and uh, just passing through on their way to the salt ponds in Redondo. But contrary to various old sources still circulating, there's no archaeological evidence um, that uh, there was ever a village here or an Indian burial ground. Um, we did find some artifacts uh, in town. But uh, the nearest archaeologically recognized village was up in uh, Play de Ray, um, where Bayona Creek was a freshwater source. Um, transportation, of course, also played um, a major sh uh, part in shaping uh, Manhattan Beach. Um, that's transportation for us there. <laughs> um, Manhattan Beach was quite inaccessible. For a town to be established and grow requires that people are able to get here. Uh, an individual named J.D. Spreckles of Spreckles Sugar um, was an early railroad uh, entrepreneur at the turn of the century, and he said, quote, <laughs> uh, transportation determines the flow of population. Before you can hope to get people to live anywhere, you must first, uh, first of all, show them that they can get there quickly, comfortably, and above all, cheaply. That looks comfortable. Um, <laughs> in the mid 1800s, it wasn't easy to get to Los Angeles. Um, San Pedro was pretty much the port for Los Angeles, but it was considered a poor harbor. That is not a great harbor. 
it was a little while before they actually were uh, uh, dredged the harbor and built breakwater and wharves. What really changed Los Angeles from being a small cow town was the railroad. The Transcontinental Railroad to Sacramento was completed in 1869. I will bore you with dates today. <laughs> <laughs> but the Southern Pacific Railroad completed its line from San Francisco to LA in 1876, and we're almost within our own memories at this point, linking, to, uh, uh, linking LA to the National Railroad Network. Redondo Beach, which had a deep water port, um, they built a wharf to accommodate shipping. And in 1888, a railroad line from uh, Los Angeles uh, was built down uh, to Redondo Beach. Um, just as the arrival of the railroad uh, had made LA accessible, uh, this railroad line uh, made uh, our area accessible. It started a land boom in uh, LA, and uh, subsequently, it started a land boom here. Uh, in 1887, um, it was actually pretty cool. Um, in 1887, a group of investors bought the property that would later become Manhattan Beach. The Potencia Landside Company, I think I'm getting ahead of myself here. The Potencia Landside Company with, uh, oh, that's what I was gonna say, is that while this was all going on, um, land development firms published pamphlets praising the beach areas. The temperate climate was popular, popularly represented as being beneficial to one's health. Um, and seaside resort living was starting to become popular. Once upon a time, nobody wanted to live at the beach. The beach was dangerous. The ocean would take you away. Um, no, people didn't even really swim that much back in the day. Um, that was, uh, that's a relatively new thing for everybody. That's why they had rental swimsuits. Nobody owned their own swimsuit. They rented them. That's, that's all they offered there, they needed it. But anyway, well, the Potential Land Site uh, Company with John Ward, president, um, they uh, got together and partnered with a guy named Parvin Wright, who conceived the contraption to generate electricity, harnessing ocean waves uh, to generate electricity. Seems like a natural thing, right? I mean, it's there, it's moving all the time. It should be, it should be possible. So they built the town's first pier uh, to test the motor, and uh, for a little while it seemed to work. But not really. Uh, they had big plans. They were gonna uh, produce electricity for Manhattan Beach and maybe for Los Angeles. They had grand dreams. Um, they used uh, steel railroad uh, rails to build the pier. And, and things were going okay until in the, in the long run, uh, of course, the storm came along and took out 30 feet of the, uh, 30 feet of the pier. Basically, they went broke. Um, so, in 1901, a new development, it, the development of a new resort was announced. Um, it was to be called Manhattan Beach, 1901. John A. Merrill was the president of the, uh, of the uh, Manhattan Beach Company and he bought uh, Potencia's 40 acres and then another 450 acres from the Redondo Land Company. A little breath here. Um, about two months later, he sold the northern 300 acres to developer George Peck. Um, buy here now. Um, so he sold uh, land to George Peck. And Peck began developing what he advertised as North Manhattan Beach. Soon, another developer came along named Frank S. Darty. Uh, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. So, if, I, if I'm not if I'm not getting the name right, just speak right up. Um, and so uh, Darty and the uh, uh, Highland Beach Company bought a section of Merrill's property from about 13th up to 22nd Street. 
Merrill retained what was uh, uh, named Center Street at the time, which ran from uh, Center, the Santa Fe Railroad stop uh, down to the Iron Pier. And these three primary develop these, they were the three primary developers in the very early days. But from there it gets complicated. Uh, the man in Patton Beach Company um, uh, 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 sold and became the Manhattan Beach Development Company, and there were investors and land speculators who got involved. Developers brought potential buyers into town, uh, and uh, and uh, they would bring them down by a railroad car. They'd charter a car and bring a whole carload of people down, give them box lunches. Uh, almost reminds me of those timeshare things. Um, <laughs> i tell you the truth, but they were pitching land. They were pitching it. So many acres, so many sales, uh, so many companies. But that's what it was all about, uh, investing in real estate. Sorry, investing in real estate, uh, buying and selling. One could buy property with or without a house. And, uh, and if you wanted to uh, build a house, the real estate agents could uh, help you with that. As the towns grew, their investments became more valuable. Your investment became more valuable. <laughs> Some developers, such as Henry Huntington, built rail lines. And they built them to their land holdings. Uh, Moses Sherman and a guy named Eli Clark built the Los Angeles, Hermosa Beach and Redondo Railway Company which ran from LA through Ivy Station, uh, which we now know as Culver City, to Playa del Rey and then on down to Redondo. <laughs> it was an electric railroad. Um, oh it was an electric railroad, that is to say a trolley. Um, and of course, Sherman and Clark had land investments in, uh, in Playa del Rey and uh, in Hermosa Beach. Um, that uh, railroad began running in 1903 and made Manhattan Beach even easier to reach. Um, the town began to bloom, and despite, despite still being mostly a great many sand dunes, um, seriously, still a great many sand dunes clustered around an old pier, but the trolley was a big factor in the growth of the town. Real estate agents greeted the trolleys at their stops. Um, Some of the real estate agents chartered parlor cars and brought down customers. Um, the uh, LAPR uh, eventually was bought by the Pacific Electric the Railroad Company in the great merger of 1911, and they became uh, part of the famous Red Line at that point. Um, it's quite intimidating having so many historians in the room. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you can fact check me like crazy. Anyway, even with the electric railroad, uh, Manhattan Beach was remote. It wasn't until the end of, uh, hello, 25 cents, come on, for a, for a train ride around LA. Um, it wasn't until the end of 1912 that the town was incorporated as a class six town with a population of approximately 600 people. And I still kind of wonder if they didn't exaggerate that just a little bit. <laughs> um, but, um, and you know what, I don't know what a class six town is. I tried to find out. Uh, they don't exist any longer. Uh, so I don't, I haven't been able to find records yet of what a class six town was, but apparently it wasn't very big. Um, because nowadays you have to have at least 1,500 people before you can even begin to self-incorporate. Um, but anyway, um, where was I on all of this? So uh, the towns began to bloom. Um, let's see. The town had barely been incorporated when the old Iron Pier was destroyed by a storm. Um, tiny community argued about whether or not to build another pier. Another pier costs a lot of money. On the other hand, a pier is a pier. You've got to have a pier if you're a beach community. Uh, it was just crucial to the community. So they struggled with that for a little while, uh, and they uh, built, built roads and they added services, and then they had to deal with a world war and uh, with a uh, international pandemic, the great flu influenza epidemic. 
They were, they were hard times. Sorry, been incorporated. Moving on. Still, with all of this going on, the developers and the real estate agents pressed on advertising the potential of this new little town. Um, for what was still really a very remote area, um, developers like Henry Sadler, who put out this brochure, were, um, were just, they were downright florid is what they were. Um, this particular prospectus came out in 1913. Um, and in it, he proclaimed, fortunes are made in real estate. Few men become wealthy by individual effort, by their savings from earnings, but most wealth is acquired by judicious investment in real estate and the enhancement of its value. John Jacob Astor's millions were made in New York in this way, as were those of hundreds of others and instances could be cited by the thousands. It continues that not everyone, um, not everyone can become rich, but almost anyone can secure a lot or two in Manhattan at the present low prices and easy plan of payments offered, with the almost positive assurances that in a very short space of time, their investment will bring them double the original price. Um, he continues that in fact, most of the lots have been picked up by Los Angeles and Pasadena businessmen who are familiar with real estate, values and opportunities, and they know a good bargain when they see it. There's left only a few years in which people will be able to buy property for homes by the ocean, unless they're possessed of large wealth or princely incomes. <laughs> Very <laughs> accurate. <laughs> 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 Every safeguard is being thrown uh, into a, 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 a thrown around Manhattan to make it a city of homes, a home city, in all that the name implies. And yet, in 1928, um, <laughs> in 1928, a news article was headlined, only 20 lots remain unsold on oceanfront. Considering that they were trying to sell it for almost 30 years <laughs> at this point, and they still had 20 lots on the strand that they couldn't get rid of. Um, I'm not sure how intimidating this headline really was. Um, by 1920, the town had grown from 600 to 859, <laughs> according to the U.S. Census. Those aren't really big numbers, but as a percentage, it's a 43% uh, population increase in eight years. A year later, they claimed another 316 people had moved into Manhattan Beach, bringing the total population to all of 1,175 people. It's moving, though. Right? Let's move forward just a little bit here. Yes. Then there was Bruce's Beach. As part of our history, this was an ugly episode in our small town's history. It's been thoroughly studied and documented by the History Advisory Board that the City Council convened, and you can read all about it online. I'm going to recap it briefly, and hopefully I won't get anything too wrong. Um, briefly, Mrs. Bruce, and her husband, um, who were an African-American couple, bought an empty lot on the Strand just north of 26th Street near Peck's Pavilion at 27th. This was in 1912, just before the town was incorporated. She started a small beach resort for blacks that eventually included a two-story bathhouse with dining and dancing. The Bruce's later bought a second Strand lot uh, next to them to uh, expand their business which was becoming increasingly popular, drawing hundreds of African Americans to the beach. Well, some, story, some historians include the 1910s and the early 1920s in a period that they consider to be the nadir of race relations. Things were bad back then. Um, it was a time of comparatively open racism and anti-black violence. The U.S. Senator from California uh, flat out ran on a Keep America White, uh, I mean Keep California White uh, campaign uh, platform. Um, 
anti-Chinese and anti-Japanese sentiments were also raging in California. Racism was on the rise in the U.S., the United Kingdom, Canada, and Mexico. Manhattan Beach was not immune to the times. The situation deteriorated after a couple of other black families bought property in town, and the Bruce's Beach holiday crowds reportedly numbered as high as 3,000. Personally, I think that's probably an exaggeration, but uh, it was a lot of people coming into town. Um, the board of trustees was being, uh, which was of course our, our previously what our city council was, was being pressured by some residents to do something. In particular, uh, being pressed by a relatively new resident. Um, I keep forgetting to change my slides. George Lindsay and his family arrived in Manhattan Beach from Missouri in 1920, and Lindsay decided to sell real estate. Because who doesn't sell real estate? That's much too kind. Thank you. Uh, the trustees couldn't do anything about it, but Lindsay soon proposed that the city use eminent domain to build a city park. Um, apologies. Um, by condemning the Bruce's property and all the properties straight up the hill from the uh, Bruce's lots to Highland. This included four properties bought by uh, blacks who uh, built beach cottages uh, on their uh, property. But meanwhile, unknown persons harassed and committed various terroristic acts against the blacks. The crimes led to an investigation by the LA County DA uh, into what uh, they were describing as a race war. However, no suspects were identified or prosecuted. The eminent domain action by the city was initially challenged, um, but it was upheld in the courts. Um, where are we? There we are. Bruce just said that they'd uh, leave when a sufficient reimbursement uh, had been made to them. Um, they'd originally uh, paid, and I hope I get these figures right, they'd originally paid uh, 12, that's uh, $1,225 for their first lot and uh, $10 for their second lot, as I recall. Um, the city offered them $14,500 for their properties and their business, which is about 11 times what they'd uh, paid initially. Uh, the Bruce's took the offer um, and left Manhattan Beach. The other property owners were given less money and uh, they bought other properties uh, nearby. But most soon um, moved on because the climate here was not friendly. Um, again, for the details, I refer you to the city's History Advisory Board report, which was thoroughly researched. While the Board of Trustees, on, you know, terroristic acts, I mean, they were burning houses, shooting bullets into a building. Um, ah, yes. While the trustees knew that the uh, uh, couldn't that the uh, black owners could simply buy other properties, there was another tactic being used in Manhattan Beach. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, neighborhoods nationwide, and that those were the racially restrictive uh, deeds that prevented the sale of property to any but uh, white buyers. A U.S. Supreme Court ruling in 1917 had declared racially based uh, zoning to be unconstitutional, but it only applied to legal statutes, not private contracts. Uh, these covenants weren't uh, placed on every deed, um, but uh, they were widely used uh, until uh, in 1948, the Supreme Court found that racial covenants could not be enforced by the state or the courts. That being my grandparents' house on the hill section in 1940-ish, and it has the whole clause right in there that talks about um, the covenant running with the land, and if somebody other than a white person were to buy the property, it would immediately revert back to the original owner. Mm -hmm. wow. yep. 
Meanwhile, meanwhile, real estate agents and town boosters wrote articles, pamphlets, and brochures continuing to extol Manhattan Beach. Um, as a city of homes. Um, 1928, one article declared, quote, there are no typical beach concessions or cheap amusements, devices, or shows. The property owners and residences will always be free from having their beach spoiled by the cheap amusement crowd. <laughs> this is uh, Santa Monica, I believe. Yes, the Santa Monica Pier. Venice was quite the uh, entertainment zone. They were considered the Coney Island of the West Coast. Um, one real estate agent that I spoke to uh, explained that Manhattan Beach was a planned city compared to, say, Hermosa, uh, which he said uh, grew up more or less organically. Uh, that, this is his opinion, his assessment of it. He says the result of that is that Manhattan Beach uh, is pretty much oriented towards families. And he says that, uh, in fact, nowadays, um, many of the home buyers are young families. Um, we've always been a family town, uh, a residential community. Um, so they push that quite a bit. Um, but Manhattan Beach faced challenges along with uh, everybody else during the depression of the 1930s, and then, of course, World War II. Um, the home city. Uh, I've gotten a little ahead. Um, the red car stopped running along the beach and was superseded by bus lines uh, and the growing popularity of the automobile. But things didn't come to a standstill. In 1930, uh, the state of California attempted to purchase and take possession of the beaches uh, owned by Manhattan Beach, uh, by the Manhattan Beach Development Company and George Peck because the beaches were not public property. They were privately owned. And it's another thing that everybody kind of forgets and it's sort of hard to grasp. Uh, even today, um, well, now today the beaches are all considered absolutely public property, up to the mean high tide line, um, which is rather specific. Uh, so you find beaches that, uh, up in Malibu, for example, that are for all intents and purposes, still pretty private. You can get down to the water. If you get down to the water, you can be down there. Um, but, um, but the beaches in uh, Manhattan Beach were, um, George Peck owned a great deal of the beach. Um, now George Peck went along with this. Uh, the, uh, they, there was a, a state park act and um, they were trying to save land for public parks. Um, and he was perfectly happy to, uh, take his money and, uh, and turn the, uh, his beaches over to the state. But a little farther south, um, let's see. A little farther south, it was owned by uh, one James Corlew, who had uh, bought the land from John Merrill. And uh, this court struggle went on for decades. Um, he eventually sold his land to his attorney uh, Neil McCarthy, and McCarthy attempted to develop the land. He wanted to build houses on the beach. Um, the city wouldn't let him do that. Uh, there were zoning things that uh, came into uh, play. Uh, McCarthy fenced the land. He started charging admission to go on the beach. That's a fence, by the way. Catching up on my slides here. Um, and so this uh, went on until 1956. Uh, so now we're talking about within your memories, uh, when the state finally managed to buy uh, McCarthy's property. Um, meanwhile, World War II. The, popula the population of Manhattan Beach climbed from 1891 to 1930 uh, to 6,398 people in 1940. That was an increase of 200%. Uh, Following World War II, the population boom continued as most service me as many service members returned home, and many passed through Southern California, including Manhattan Beach, uh, and they liked what they saw here. Uh, the population rose to 17,000 
by 1950. The aircraft manufacturing and uh, later the aerospace companies uh, provided employment. Um, and Manhattan Beach, which had always styled itself as a family community, became home to a uh, still rapidly growing population. In 1970, the population reached 35,000. What are we looking at? Ah, yes, okay, a little bit ahead. Um, in 1970, the population reached 35,352, just slightly over today's estimated population. Also in 1953, the last agricultural land zones in East Manhattan Beach were rezoned for residential housing, and construction boomed. Now this is sort of mind-breaking to me. Uh, other side of Sepulveda was farmland. Not all of it, but uh, a great deal of it was in 1953 which is uh, within my lifetime. Um, the town has changed, as Henry pointed out earlier, <laughs> and in case nobody had noticed, the, t the town has changed. Anyway, as we came to come to the end of the 40s and the 50s, we, uh, um, we do reach a familiar period for many of you. And so this is where I hesitate to say anything because you'll say, no, that's not the way it was. <laughs> but anyway, among other things, uh, El Porto was finally uh, annexed. Oh, so here we are. Sorry, that's a before and after shot there of, of uh, East Manhattan Beach. Um, North. What's that? North Manhattan Beach. East, east, on the other side of Spolita. Yeah. Um, Anyway, El Porto, sorry, behind my slides. Um, El Porto was finally annexed by Manhattan Beach in 1980. It's weird how they had resisted uh, annexation. Uh, uh, at one election, they had 100% uh, of the people eligible to vote in, in uh, El Porto voted, all 10 of them. <laughs> um, and they voted seven to three against being uh, part of Manhattan Beach. Um, they also didn't want to be part of El Segundo. And um, I wish I had been born just a little earlier because uh, El Porto sounded like it became quite the fun place. They, they, I think their purpose was to avoid the law. <laughs> <laughs> of course, like that. Isn't that always the purpose? <laughs> anyway, uh, words about Manhattan Beach's uh, cherished small town atmosphere began as the homes began. Uh, increasing in size to the point where new houses were referred to as McMansions. Um, debate over building size and property rights or, uh, ensued. A mansionization committee was formed by council to address the concerns. A triple lot merger on the strand made everybody's hair catch on fire. Um, and, um, and ordinances were passed, allegedly. <laughs> Um, and I mean, it, it just got so crazy. Real estate's just been so crazy, we even have Monopoly games. This is the original one from uh, our 75th town anniversary. And then you have the newer one. Why not do it twice? Um, and now we have Veranda and High Rose, that project, and mandates by the state to increase density and to add low income housing. Um, the point of it all is real estate has been, if not the key industry, certainly uh, an essential uh, industry uh, to our town. It's all about real estate. Um, it kind of breaks my brain. Uh, lucky I got in, honestly, <laughs> tell you the truth. Uh, Real estate started our town and shaped our town and continues to drive Manhattan Beach. But that brings me to the second part of this little song and dance. Um, a uh, 10 year project of the uh, Historical Society, which was uh, the Historic Real Estate Office. Oh, and we forgot to mention this. I forgot to mention this. This just came out uh, like a week ago that the median price of town of a home in Manhattan Beach has now reached $3.1 million. Man alive. Uh, my children can't move here, by the way. 
Anyway, um, what that shows is glad to see your back. 